Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Spire, and I appreciate you taking a few minutes to spend some time with me. Um, I've been a serial entrepreneur and an investor for the last 30 years, uh, mostly in the technology space, uh, but with a focus on impact and ESG uh, for the last 20 or so years. So I uh, started my career in finance and ended up managing the assets of a private philanthropic foundation in the United States. And through that process, um, the, the the philanthropic interest of the foundation were, was all things related to the environment. So water preservation, land preservation, agriculture, and so forth. So in the, in the mid nineties, I started to talk to other family offices, other, I'm sorry, start, started talking to other family offices and other foundations about what they were investing in and started making direct investments in technology companies that were trying to solve a lot of the problems we were otherwise trying to help philanthropically. So that started me on a career that's now spanned, as I said, close to 30 years in uh, over 15 different countries around the world. So uh, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the things I've learned along the way. And then I think it's important to give some real life um, uh, examples in terms of things that, that I've seen work and, and haven't been working. So um, I, when I started doing direct deals, I was really focused on technology. And so I had got involved with some medical instrument companies. We did have a vertical farming company. We actually just uh, opened the largest vertical farm in the world in Dubai for Emirates Airlines. And that was interesting because we were really focused on the technology there, the best way to grow plants indoors and vertical farms. And that's actually turned out <laughs> quite well now, And, and uh, but there was obviously a lot of struggles. And you also see competition in markets uh, that can be very difficult. So there are other vertical farming companies that haven't been nearly as successful from an actual impact standpoint or a business model standpoint, but they have extreme valuations and it's made the market very, very difficult for people that actually have very good technology and very good um, business. Uh, I also worked, like I mentioned, in, in some uh, medical device companies in South Africa, and that's now coming through the Swiss company and will be launched later this year where they use um, a wearable that does neuroplasticity in the brain and helps people recover from all sorts of injuries, brain injuries, um, but also uh, we just recently did our FDA um, phase two studies where they were able to get kids who were on medication for ADHD completely off their drugs within one month by simply using a wearable um, technology and, the, and it's a permanent fix, which is great there, so they no longer have to take meds. So it's a big focus to get a lot of these people, especially in the US that are over medicated in a lot of ways. So um, there's, there's uh, things like that that I've been working on. The status of the global market is probably the most interesting now that I'm most fo focused on impact and, and uh, the U.S. obviously is quite a bit behind Europe in terms of the way they think about uh, the environment, the way they think about how to help um, keep the planet from going in the direction that we're currently going. And so I've been hyper-focused um, in companies in Switzerland, companies here in Germany, and, and other places um, that are trying to solve a lot of those problems. The U.S. Uh, is starting to do that because unfortunately it became a, a, a buzzword or a click word for a lot of the financial institutions. Once they understood that, oh, people are actually very interested, especially with our current uh, president, and, and uh, there's so much pressure on companies to now conform to say we're going to be more ESG focused, we're going to be more environmentally focused, but they really have no way to get there, which is very interesting. Um, I think there's also another amazing trend, particularly in the U.S., uh, around financing. Financing is extremely difficult for small startups in the ESG impact field because there's absolutely zero expertise. I shouldn't say zero. There's very little expertise in finance for people um, in the impact space. So I have spent the last two years raising money for a company, which I'll explain to you later on. And it's funny because, I mean, I've talked to every big name there is in the U.S. and you realize that these people literally just started that job maybe four or five months ago. Oh, we went out and we raised this $7 billion impact fund, um, and we're really interested in doing that. And then you realize they're only writing checks north of $250 million. And at the same time, they want venture or private equity type returns, um, but with the safety of a double A rated bond. And those two don't, don't mix at all. So there's this very interesting and large funding gap for startups and I'd say mid-sized companies that need the financing to get to the next level. So there's a lot of different programs we're working on. Um, there's a group out of, out of Zurich um, called Blue Eight 
on the blue and the, the number eight dot global doing a very interesting finance regimen uh, where they're able to go in and get financing for projects specifically, um, and not through governments, but through private financing, through uh, family offices, through corporations, people that really wanna make this happen. And I think that's probably my biggest point about the governments are great in, in responding to and supporting these initiatives. However, they're not the ones that are gonna fix the problems. They can be very helpful in terms of financing, they can be very helpful in terms of regulation, making laws, things like that. But in the end, it's gonna come down to entrepreneurs like yourselves, it's gonna come down to unique financing vehicles, and it's gonna come down to um, the ability to get the technologies into the market. The other thing that we really need, there's a group I'm working with currently in, in France called Beyond Builders, is designing platforms and technologies to really track what impact you're having. So, you know, I, I happen to be in the tire recycling industry and you hear large corporations that make tires saying, oh, by 2025, we want to be here. And by 2030, we want to be completely, you know, green with 100 percent, you know, uh, renewable tires. Well, it's honestly, it's almost impossible um, because, you know, they want to make the statements and they want to be there because they're being pressured by not only their shareholders, but government entities and so forth to make these statements. But in the end, they don't necessarily have the technology to reach those goals. So again, it's gonna take corporations supporting tech entrepreneurs and other groups to get all these products to market and in a way that's both economically and environmentally sustainable, which is the most important thing. Um, the other big thing that we're working on right now is renewable energies, because with the most unfortunate region uh, excursion with Russia, Russia and the Ukraine, um, energy prices in Europe and Eastern Europe, where I do a lot of business, have gone you know, through the roof in terms of cost per kilowatt hour. And so some of these projects actually are reasonably energy intensive. So I spent the last two years scouring the planet, trying to find the best solutions for decentralized energy to help run some of these plants. Um, because there's not many business models that work with, if it's very electrically intensive at 40 cents a kilowatt hour or whatever it might be, it become, makes, makes the business model very difficult. So we, uh, we've been work there's a large group I'm working with all over Eastern Europe, the Baltic Sea region and so forth that are trying to build the very small nuclear SMRs. Um, that's always difficult again because people just hear nuclear and they don't necessarily know all the facts around that. Um, we're also working with a great company called Gen Hydro out of the U.S., which I'm in full transparency. I am an investor and, and, and uh, an advisor, but I like it because uh, they're taking recycled aluminum. So all the, the cans left over from Oktoberfest and everything else, and they're able to take that scrap aluminum, add an adjutant to it and water. Each one of these reactors uses the recycled aluminum and adjutant and water, and the reactors are very small footprint and they put out 125 megawatts of electricity per hour, 125 kg of green hydrogen, and then they also have a, a byproduct called alumina, which is another very high value product if you do continued refining of it for the chip industry, the medical industry, and things like that. So you've got these very interesting burgeoning technologies that just need you know, the ability to move into other countries, get governmental support, work with regulators to make all these sort of things happen. Um, I would say that there's two things that I really focus on, usually when I speak to young entrepreneurs, is that I've been selling technologies for, as I mentioned, 30 years. I actually co-founded, there's early and then there's way, way, way too early, but I co-founded a machine learning artificial intelligence company in 1999 in Minsk, Belarus. <laughs> so kind of a, an interesting place at that time and, and unfortunately today, um, but also you know, just very, very early in the technology spectrum. But it was great. We worked out over years and, and uh, you know, turned into actually a great company. Um, I would say the two things I've learned though is having tried to sell technology like very early artificial intelligence or machine learning is that selling a technology can be extraordinarily difficult. My recommendation and what I've found is that selling a solution is a much better prospect. And so what we focus on is the combinatorial effect of bringing multiple technologies together to try and figure out the best way to make a business that's very, very resilient, both from a business model standpoint, and in, in our case, environmentally very sustainable. So I, I, I love to use real world examples. 
because I think it's very important to understand why they work the way they do and why they work so well. So again, not a pitch because the, the company's doing very well, um, but we, we started in the tire recycling industry. Tires are a massive global waste problem. There's the reason that tires are so hard to recycle is because they're highly indestructible, which is why they do so well on your car and on the road and all the impact and everything they take. So there's been technologies around for many, many years. Pyrolysis is the pri primary one, the gasification of tires and a reactor, you know, to release the oils and so forth. Uh, the problem is that the business model on its own is not very sustainable. I was involved with a pyrolysis company here in Munich for 12 years, and we realized we weren't really getting it done. So we created an entire new business model, um, tire flow in the US, where we, we took the entire supply chain and we wanted to control every aspect of it, both economically and environmentally. So my business partner, uh, Jim Meckley, he started a company called Tyrex. Tyrex came up with a better compaction technology for when you pick up tires. So tire collectors will go to an auto retailer or a, a tire retailer, they'll pick up the tires and then they, they have to figure out what to do with them. That compaction technology allows you to pick up many more tires per truckload, which obviously saves fuel, save, you know, all the different things. Then we go to um, our plant where we take the tires and we chip them up. And when we chip them up into small chips, we pull the steel out. That steel is now replacing rebar in concrete. This entire building is made out of, out of concrete, but there's probably rebar. Rebar is made in a steel manufacturing plant, releases a lot of CO2 and becomes very difficult um, from an environmental standpoint and from a labor standpoint. Now they can take the very small pieces of wire from the tires and put them directly into the concrete and they can pour it right out of the truck or whatever it is to make slabs for, for shopping stores, for you know buildings like this, precast concrete. So you're using the steel. Once we're done with that, we have two separate processes. Those tire chips then go to one process called neochrome. In neochrome, we basically, for every ton of rubber powder that we get from the tires, we add two tons of recycled plastics from groups like Rivago and DuPont and so forth. From that, we're able to make um, pellets, which are then rolled or, or morphed into many different products. So we make everything from, from uh, the, the, the uh, liners for a golf cart, the floor of a golf cart, to truck beds, to board products. So you, know, you look at all the, the logistics firms, most of the insides of those trucks are, are natural hardwoods. It actually, most of it comes from the Amazon. So we're trying to replace those boards with great uh, recycled, recovered products of recycled tires and recycled plastics. They'll last longer, they're lighter than the wood, and when you're done, we can take them back and make them into all brand new products again. The other side of the factory, we take the, we take the tire chips and we put them into a pyrolysis reactor. As they heat up, the gasification starts, we take the gas off and the gas goes into um, the actual burners to run the unit, so it becomes its own island solution for power. Once that process is done, it continues to gasify and a heavier gas comes off, which is condensated into oil. That oil is now being bought by large corporations like BASF, where they're taking that, that now recovered oil and turning it into cosmetics and plastic products and all sorts of great things. Um, in the end, in the pyrolysis unit, you have a, a char, which is basically everything else that was left in the tire. And the problem with that char is it can't be used in new passenger tires because it just, it has all sorts of silica and zinc and other bits of, we call it ash content of almost 20%. There's a great company here in Munich that I work with um, called RCB Nanotechnologies. That company worked at the Freunhofer Institute here in Munich and their mineralization department and basically figured out the, the first of its kind technology to remove the zinc, remove the silica and in a hydrothermal washing process so that you're left with a 98% pure carbon black which is now a very high value product, which is being sought after by you know, all the, the tire and, and manufacturers and plastic manufacturers. So most people don't know what carbon black is, but everything black that's around you has carbon black in it. So plastics, your televisions, your iPhones, everything has carbon black in it. So it's a massive global market. And the problem is when you make virgin carbon black, it's made with crude oil and every ton that they produce releases three tons of CO2. So it's a filthy process, and now we have a recovered substitute for that that we're working on. And then at the end, again, I had mentioned Gen Hydro. Gen Hydro will help us power those plants in areas where potentially electricity is too expensive to make the business model work. And then we're also working with direct, um, direct capture carbon companies. 
because um, Climbworks is a great example. They have, I think, some of the best uh, commercial technology available out of Zurich, and they take excess heat to run their plant. Well, during the pyrolysis uh, process, there's a lot of excess heat, and we can use that for direct air carbon. So in the example I'm using, it's we've now combined uh, seven different technologies from five different countries. And in that process, we were able to then basically bring in all those components. The, the real benefit that, of that is that each one of these um, plants with all these new technologies will sell between, say, between 500 and 700,000 tons of CO2 per year. We have, a, we have a model now to build out six plants in the next few years and hopefully you know, save close to 3 million tons of CO2 while reclaiming all these different products and putting back into the market. So it's a, it's a very exciting time. I mean, it's, it's a really, I, I would say, the, the ability to find specialty financing, find great strategic partners. There's a huge onus on this, on this sector. I think you'll find tremendous support at the government level obviously at the university level and, and at the social level. People want to see these types of things do well, these types of projects. And, and as I mentioned, my one thing is the, the combination of multiple technologies. People tend to create technologies and they're very protective. And sometimes you need to look outside that and say, hey, who else could be a great strategic partner for me? Who else would really enhance my work and I could also enhance their work? And, and what that does is not only enhances the environmentally, but also from an economic sustainability standpoint, because you can't be focused on projects that constantly need grants from the government, because you never know when a regime change or something will disrupt that. Um, and so in the tire flow model, for instance, the one I just mentioned, we have about 19 different economic levers we can pull. I mean, if you make a single widget and you say, hey, this widget is great, but that market just disappeared. You know, if something happens to the carbon black market or something happens to the zinc or the silicon market or the oil market or the concrete market or something, it's not gonna affect the rest of the business and it's probably temporary anyway. So having multiple economic levers to pull inside your company can be extraordinarily helpful. Um, and I would just, the only other thing I would say is, you know, really look around you, see what other people are working on. I basically travel for a living, <laughs> um, which I know is not that environmentally sensitive, but it's very important for me to be able to get to these different places and see all these technologies because they're not gonna come looking for me. Um, so I hope you found some of this helpful. I thank you very much for the work you're doing, both in the environment and, uh, and uh, here at the university, and um, please uh, keep it up.